asked me to talk a little bit about um, kind of some of my experiences in um, building technology companies. Um, as mentioned, my undergrad's in computer science and then I did my MBA and I did both of them from BYU. So um, my background is obviously heavy on the, the technology side. Um, and so let me just tell you a little bit more about me and then I wanted to kind of go through some of the things that I've learned and kind of leave you as some of um, my pointers. So one of the philosophies that I really subscribe to is what Reid Hoffman talked about in a book called The Startup of You. And he talks about the fact, he, I, I pull out those three words, but adapt to the future, invest in yourself, and transform your career. In the book, he talks a lot about how you get to own your career. So um, if you think about your parents or even 40 years ago, right, when they went into a career, they were most likely going to have the same job for the rest of their life. They were going to go work for corporate America. They were going to stay there. Um, it was an expectation. Right? Um, even back when I was doing my undergrad, right, Ford would come in and they would recruit a lot of the business students. Those guys would be on a path to go work for Ford forever. But we don't really live in that world anymore. Um, now, my work at Disney, there's plenty of people who have been there for 35 or 40 years. But it is not very much the norm anymore. And what I like about what he talks about is that the power of the career that you're going to build is in your own hands. And so you, the time and the energy that you invest in, the things that you learn, the skills that you gain, the networks that you build, they're your own. And your, your opportunities lie in your own abilities to go figure those things out. There isn't an expectation you're going to take one job and have it forever. You're building a career which is based on lots of different stepping stones that you'll have um, over the course of the life that you work. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about what that's meant for me, because I wear lots of different hats. But they are all centered in common things. So today, I'm running a company in the 3D printing space. Um, but previous to this, I'll talk a little bit about the years that I spent working with Disney. Um, but I also run and co-found the Women Tech Council here in the state. We started about eight years ago. We have about 4,000 people in that community. There's lots of different, and I work as an operating partner at a private equity firm, right? I wear lots of different hats, but I do it because it allows me to build the career path that I want um, and with lots of different things. But for me, my path has always been grounded in two, two big things. One is technology. I love technology. I did my undergrad in technology. I'm always drawn to the way technology can help us solve really interesting problems or creates new opportunities. So everything I do thinks about technology. Um, and I also have a really strong affinity for how you think about customer acquisition. Um, so how do you acquire customers? What do those target customers look like? Why do they buy? How do you get them to buy? How do you increase conversion? What are the viral loops you create? All of those things are things that kind of naturally come to me and that I'm really interested in figuring out. And so in the work that I do, I spend time finding things that cross between those two. Um, a company, a few, um, a few companies ago, um, we built an app on Facebook that we grew to 80 million users. And we got to do lots of really interesting things about figuring out what those viral loops were of how you would get customers to come and how you would use one customer to get you know, exponentially more customers and what would keep them coming back and how you build a business model behind those. So for me, those are drivers and it hasn't led me on the same path. So I haven't been in enterprise sales or enterprise software companies from day one. I've been in many, many different directions. And all of them come back to these two core principles, but none of them are the same. Um, and I can't decide sometimes if that's fully good or bad, but it has led to lots of really great opportunities um, that I've had the opportunity to do, and I wanted to share a few of those with you. For the last four years before I started the company I'm currently in, I worked as an entrepreneur in residence at Disney. And I got to work on two parts of it. I got to work on um, technology commercialization. So inside of Disney, there's these big research labs that are all um, tied to academic institutions, like Carnegie Mellon and Harvard and MIT and ETH in Switzerland. And there's academics working on solving really hard problems that Disney could benefit from. And so I got to come in and work in a role where we figured out if we could make businesses out of that technology. Um, and that meant I got an opportunity to work with everyone from ESPN to ABC to the studios to interactive to theme parks. Um, I also got to spend a bunch of my time working in um, Disney's theme park um, merchandise group, which does all of the retail um, inside of the parks. One of the really cool things about that is all the things they think about is how technology can work inside of parks and what it means from a merchandise perspective. Um, those two opportunities inside of Disney, I spent four, four years basically focused on only that. 
um, would never have been possible without those kind of things that are core to who I am, both the technology side and that business side of customer acquisition. Um, because those two together led me to all these really cool kinds of opportunities um, where I just got an opportunity to work with really great teams. Sometimes the teams were hundreds of people, sometimes they were really small. I would tell you that most of my projects at Disney you can't actually know about because they're confidential, um, but there's some that I got an opportunity to work on that you will have seen. Um, Disney launched a couple of years ago a program called Glow With The Show, um, and it's, if you go to any nighttime spectacular, you can wear Mickey ears, and they glow with the nighttime spectacular, making guests part of the show. Um, and so, oh, I did bring some stuff. One of the samples, or the, the whatever, the ears that we created um, came out of that. And this product, you know, it's really cool. You go in the park, it's all infrared enabled. You watch the, um, how many of you have seen the world of color? You guys gotta go to Disneyland more. Um, and the World of Color is in California Adventure. It's this really cool nighttime show. It's made of water. Think of the Bellagio on steroids. It's better than, better than the Bellagio. It's light, it's fire, it's water, it's projection, right? The water gets used as a projection for video. You have all sorts of interaction. And now, all these lights that you see here is, um, are all people wearing Mickey ears that glow with whatever the, the staging is of the shows. Right, that's just a really cool way to think of using technology. And Disney does that in lots of things, right? All you have to do is kind of watch their platforms and what gets talked about. I was looking at an article that came out a couple of weeks ago where some of the research guys had created um, a robot who can write in the sand, right? So the robot will go out and he can write messages in the sand or draw Nemo or whatever. Right? They're just really interesting types of things. And if you come from a Disney perspective, it's all about storytelling, right? How do we create more powerful stories that engage customers or their guests more deeply in the brand. And it's one of the most successful brands in the world because of that. Right? So whether you take the Marvel product line, the Star Wars product line, the Princess product line, three of the top brands in the world, they're all driven by story. And so they think of technology and how it enables story. So I got to work on you know, fun things like that. Um, um, and actually, just related to the Disney stuff, one of the things that I learned um, at Disney probably more than I learned anywhere else, was the power of story um, and how important. So when I went to Disney, I was like, everyone tells you that a good story sells. Right? Like, that is one of the things I learned really early on when I was starting companies. One of the very first CEOs I worked for, we had raised $58 million for our company, and he was amazing at storytelling. You put him in front of investors, and he could tell the story that everyone would come and fund. And I always used to say that to him. I'm like, you're just you know, so great at storytelling. How do you learn that? When you come out of the technology and the business side, you think of stories from marketing, and stories are not marketing. Stories are what become deeply seated and what creates the experience that people will purchase from, and that is fundamentally different. If you do any, you know, if you do any analysis or look deeply into anything that Disney has ever done, what they're most brilliant at is storytelling, right? The, the stories that invoke emotion, right, and that create a dynamic between them and the guest. Um, that creates a bond that extends past a moment of the one interaction. I mean, if you think of Frozen, which has now been like the most successful animated movie of all time, that story has transcended to many, many different ways. And their appreciation of story that um, I remember working, them kind of educating me on a Star Wars storyline we were working on, right? And every step we decided to make in uh, that interaction was based in the story of Star Wars. So you're like in the Wikipedia for Star Wars, right? And you're reading everything possible about knowing, you know, which troop came here and who is the leader of this and who might possibly become this. Because the story and understanding the story is how they get things to sell. It's the reason people go back to the park. It's the reason that when you stand in Cars Land, it's not just a kiosk that look, that's got Lightning McQueen there that's cool. It's that you actually stepped back in time to the land and that you're actually in there and you're seeing those exact car replicas and the storyline figures out how humans become part of that world and you can experience that. And th that learning and appreciating it more than marketing, because I've spent lots and lots of time in my career doing lots of marketing, right? And I am, you know, I, I, I know marketing really, really well, but I didn't have as deep appreciation for what story-driven meant until my time at Disney. And I will tell you, if you can figure out how to nail that in your own careers, it helps you do things you never thought possible because stories are the reasons brands exist. It's the reason merchandise sells. It's the reason, even if it's not a branded thing, that customers in, or users engage with some application. 
They do it because of an experience that's gr getting created and the story you're creating for them through that. Anyone ever buy the, um, the chat books that you can do from Instagram? Do you guys use Instagram? Okay, let's hope so. Okay, so Instagram, there's this interesting, um, there's an interesting app. It's a super cheap app, but all you do is you can go to chat books and you can print you know, your story from Instagram at any point in time, right? And the books are like five bucks. They're super cheap. It takes your Instagram. But the, what Instagram is, is a story, right? It's the story of your life. It's the story of interactions you have with people. It's how you tag them. Um, when I watch, I have a 14-year-old son, and they're all about, you know, how many people like how fast, right? They'll sit there and they'll watch, okay, in five minutes, did I get 70 likes? Okay, so what am I up to, right? But it's, it's telling you these stories about how they exist and their interactions and social interactions and, you know, applications like chapbooks let us make those physical. But they figured out that stories meet, are very meaningful to people and they transfer it in what we're doing. So I took, I had the opportunity to take a bunch of the stuff that I learned about storytelling and transfer that into what we do, what I currently do in the 3D printing space. Um, so my current company is called 3D Plus Me, and we're all about, we've built a really extensive per, uh, 3D printing platform that lets us personalize merchandise. So we have high resolution face scanners. We can take those face scanners and we create story driven experiences. So we went after getting all of the big license guys to let us make product for them. So we have the Marvel license, Major League Baseball, Major League Soccer, Lord of the Rings, Harry Potter. Um, we're launching with a big gaming company next week. You would all know who they are. We've done Assassin's Creed. And the way we did all of those deals was through story. So before even our technology platform was completely baked or we were ready to go to market, we had story, right? And we had the ability to say, what, what you want to do, this, the Super Awesome Me is actually a partnership we have with Hasbro, a product line we launched with Hasbro. Um, what, we, what we wanted to do is help consumers get even closer to their favorite brands. Like, how do we create these transformational experiences where you as fans of a property tie yourselves even closer? People buy costumes. Half of you probably own a shirt with some logo from some superhero on it or some Star Wars icon, right? You buy things because you're drawn to storylines. And so for us, we looked at 3D printing and said, it's the first time there's this really interesting medium where I can take you and I can make you a character, right? So this happens to be that exact example, right? So you can walk out and you can purchase this. And we've had the opportunity to not only work with some of the coolest brands, but also go to really interesting places. The experience that lets you become um, Captain America or Iron Man or Black Widow um, is we have permanent installations in Toys R Us and Times Square and FAO Schwartz and we launched in Walmarts in the fall and in Sam's and you know you go in and and the entire experience can't remember if I put the next slide um, is based on a whole a whole in-store experience that makes you feel like you're part of the storyline so for a moment in time you step into it um, the design of this one's actually inspired from in um, Captain America Winter Soldier when the back of the plane is coming down there's this structure there that's these big rivets on the back of the plane so it's all inspired like from storyline and when you step in front of it and you go through the experience, you actually see yourself become Iron Man. So on screen, you get to become Iron Man or whomever. Um, but for us, the story become, has become ultimately the thing that's, that sells. Even though we look at it as we created a technology platform where you know, we have hundreds of thousands of faces that get stored in the database right? that are also interesting and valuable, um, it lets us create interesting applications that have taken us to big partnerships with Hasbro, that have taken us to Marvel. Um, with our Major League Baseball line this year, we were at both the All-Star Game and the World Series. Um, and we'll do, we're actually gonna be at spring training next week. These are full 3D printed. But for us, right, I got this really interesting opportunity to become, we gotta make a company where we could say, take story, take technology, merge them together. And how many of you are familiar with 3D printing? You guys have a bunch of 3D printers here. 3D printing is really interesting because it allows us to do things that are not, haven't been possible before, like personalized merchandise. Um, if you should make something, if something's cheaper to make in China and you need 100,000 of it, you should make it in China. That is not what 3D printing is made for. 3D printing is not re going to replace manufacturing in China. Their parts are too expensive, it takes longer to make. You cannot get 10,000 people in a factory over here to go work on 3D printers. Make those in China, it makes sense. But where the economics change is when you can do things that are unique. 
that personalization and customization comes into play. We have obviously taken it from a retail perspective, but you know, its applications across medical and all sorts of things are very, very interesting. Um, we happen to use, you guys, most of the printers you've seen, I don't think you guys have this printer here. You guys mostly have, I think you have plastics printers mostly, or the resin printers on campus. Um, those will not make you this. You cannot make this on any printer you have in campus, uh, on campus. When this gets printed, it comes off of a printer in full color, just like this. Um, and so it, it's a powder-based material. It lays down powder and ink and binder at the same time. And when you print something, it's in full color and you do a little bit of post-processing and you're done. Um, this happens to be, if you ask me, the only full color 3D printer in the world that can work at mass scale. Um, there's a couple of other guys trying. Some are more expensive. Um, 3D Systems trying to make a plastic version that will do this, but it doesn't have a black channel. Um, 3D printing was invented 20 years ago. It came out of MIT, um, probably even 25 years ago now. Um, but just in the last three years, since the front page of The Economist had a Print Me a Stradivarius, that was the, really the first time consumers got exposed to it. And so the, the technology trend is accelerating. You know, pretty, give us 10 years, every appliance in your home, or half of them, will be tied to something related to 3D printing, whether it's from a food perspective or something else. And it's been really fun to be on the leading edge of a trend in 3D printing. Um, and it also means that there's lots of problems we're still solving. Right? And some, um, we, we make more 3D printed, full color 3D printed things for consumers than anyone else. So we get to handle all of the challenges that come with manufacturing that. Because you know, if, you make, if I have to make this body, it's really easy. I go like make a mold in China, and I go say I need 100,000, and they print this mold, even though sometimes he has you know, coloring issues. So you print him off of China, right, off the thing. He comes in a big crate, et cetera. But every one of these heads is unique, right? No one looks the same, right? We, our technology, we, we have to make all of your different head shapes work for the one same product, and then we have to print every one of those, and if there's a defect on one of them, I can't replace you with someone else. Right, so there, there's all of these challenges that we run into, uh, but we get to be on the leading edge of what's happening in the, um, in the 3D printing space. And building that company, this company has been really, really fun um, and plenty challenging at the same time. Um, so I wanted to, um, I'm gonna ignore this slide. I thought it might be real interesting for you guys for me to kind of tell you some of the things that I've come to kind of base my career and the things that I work on by. Um, at least that's what I was told, so that's what you're going to get from me today. Um, so I wanted to talk about, these are my, these are the things that I have found to be true and that I try to live by in the companies that I build, the people I interact with. And like I said, everything I do isn't just the company, um, but I get an opportunity to work with lots of great people. And in every chance, I believe this mantra, that teams win and ideas don't. There are millions of ideas. We do not have a shortage of ideas. People don't. The world doesn't. Ideas are not our problem. There's lots of amazing ideas that could help solve things. Um, but the way to those ideas win is by teams that can execute them. And there's, no, there's nothing else that stands in the way of great ideas becoming a reality except for the teams and the skills they bring to work on them. Um, I have worked on many teams where there has been one person that you have struggled with, and it creates a problem every time. You need a team of people who all contribute at the same level, who have different skill sets, and are all working together. When you see that magic happen on teams, those teams succeed. Those ideas win. Um, and, and do you know what? It, and winning doesn't always mean, hey, we sold our company for a billion dollars, right? There's all these various stages. But I will tell you that if you don't have good teams behind anything that you do, or you're not a good team player, your ideas won't be able to win. Um, because it's just too complicated. You know, if you take the company and the 3D company that we're in today, it's a really complicated business. We did not choose the easiest idea to take to market. We have hardware, we have software, we have brands, we have licenses, we have channels, right? I mean, you know, Walmart, we were in a Walmart in New Jersey um, for the launch of Superhero September, and we send our stuff in these huge crates. And so the Walmart guys in, in the back, they crushed our crate and threw it away, right? And it's, a, you know, for us, it's $2,000 for those crates. Right? You have all sorts of things right, that come into play. But if you don't have a team of people around you who can execute and who drive together, it's super hard to be successful. Um, and the other thing that I've learned related to that is if there is someone on the team that doesn't fit, it doesn't mean necessarily that someone's bad or they don't have great skills, 
But if there's someone that doesn't fit with the team and doesn't execute, you're better to make a faster decision to make that change than keep them on. Every month or every day that you spend keeping someone on a team that doesn't perform at the level the team needs to, the farther you get behind. And it's a really hard decision to make to change the team, especially depending on how people are involved. But if you can't execute, it's a struggle. You know, in our market, one, this has been really true for us. One of the ways that we've been able to get all these brands and to be able to execute on technology is because the team of people around us are amazing, right? Everyone's committed at the same level. Everyone performs an amazing amount of work every day to make it happen, and everyone's committed to the same path. We have good ways to problem solve, we have good ways to communicate, and we can make stuff happen. And anytime someone's introduced into the team that doesn't work like that, it puts us behind, it creates problems for us. So this is one of my other pieces of advice, especially that I always give college students, which is, I say, I call it, don't shut your own doors. So how, think of your life, think of how many times, um, let's say you're thinking of going to grad school, and um, I can imagine the, the, the conversation you have with yourself, where you're like, well, I don't know, I might not be able to pass the GMAT or the GRE, so I don't know if I'll really take it, and besides, I wouldn't really pass it, and I don't really know what I want to do, and so the deadline comes and goes, and you don't take the test, and you can't apply to grad school. Right? This happens all the time, right? where we're like, ah, you build this story for all the reasons you can't go do something. Right? I shouldn't go start that company. I shouldn't go and get involved with that because I wonder if you know, I don't have time for that or I don't have the right skill set or all of those kind of things. We make these stories all the time for reasons that something shouldn't be true. And I don't subscribe to that. There are enough people in this life who will tell you no, that you shouldn't be the one to do it for you. When I was coming out of my um, undergrad, I, I majored in computer science and there were three women in my graduating class. And so I interviewed, I did, I put in 100, um, applications for interviews at the Career Placement Center, and I did 100 job interviews. I had no clue what I wanted to do. I knew actually that I really wanted to stay in tech, but I didn't want to be a developer, even though I went through computer science. Those two things were true for me. Um, and, I, and then I also had, didn't have any clue. I had thought I'd want to go to grad school, so I actually took the GRE and the GMAT and applied to a bunch of grad schools. Um, and at the time, right, I didn't know what I'd score, I didn't know if anyone accepted me, didn't know what job offers I was going to get. But I did that because this statement is true. People will tell you no. You're not going to get every job you interview for. You're not going to get the score you want on every test. You're not going to get accepted to every place that you want to. So you might as well try. And, in, and I try to live by this across the board. I, don't try, I try not to create the entire reason not to do something before I've actually just gone through the steps of doing it. Right? I put forth the effort to make things happen. And eventually, right, the path that will happen um, ends up. I happened to, when I came um, during that whole process, I got my acceptance to BYU's MBA day, um, day program, and I got a job offer from Novell at the time, and it was from one of the groups that I could work tw 24 hours a day. And so I went to them and said, I'll take your offer, but only if you work for my school schedule. And they said, okay. And so uh, that's what I did, and it worked out to be a great opportunity um, along the way. But I didn't shut my own doors. I could have decided to not to apply to schools. I could have decided to not to apply for a bunch of jobs. Um, I could have decided, you know, the, taking the GRE and the GMAT was too much work, and I probably wasn't going to use one of them, but I didn't know. And in doing so, it's opened up lots of opportunities for me um, from that moment forward that have allowed me to shape my career. And I think the same thing is true for you. Don't be Go for it, right? There's nothing that stops you in, in making things happen but yourself. So this is one of the attributes I have decided is the very most important skill that I look for to hire for, and it's problem solving. The, I do not need more people to create more problems for me. I need people who, when something comes up, they don't get flustered, they don't get emotional, they just solve the problem. There, because there is a problem to everything. Business is not going to go like you want. You're going to do something wrong. Some wrong communication is going to go out. You're going to get frustrated with the situation. You're going to have a coworker you don't like. All of these things are true. Right? Your ability to handle the situation is more important than anything else you bring to the table. Your ability to be able to have a million things thrown at you that might go wrong and figure out how to solve those in a way that's constructive is, I believe, the most powerful skill you can bring to any job or any work environment. We don't need more people who get frustrated and overwhelmed and, you know, and, can't, and can't handle those situations. It's too hard, right? Every, it doesn't matter if you're starting your own company or you're working for a company. People are involved and people are emotional. And you have to solve problems because we make mistakes. 
your ability to do that and be the problem solver, this, I, I said this in an interview a couple of months ago too, when I hire, this is now the leading skill that I look for. I can train you to do certain things that I need you to do if you have a foundation of skills like this. Because I'm going to throw at you a bunch of things, right? I mean, we, we'll be in a situation, I remember a couple months ago, I'm sitting in a press conference um, with Hasbro, and we're announcing this product line. And at the same time, we're having logistical issues with what we're, we're supposed to pull off for Walmart. I've got the Walmart guys emailing me, right? And like, it's like everything's coming, right? And I'm sitting there in front of, you know, all of this press. And we're, we're going to do that press conference, and it's going to launch. I have two choices at that point in time. I can become extremely frustrated and mad and blame everyone who helped create the problem, or we just solve it, right? And we go, okay, I get it. This shouldn't have happened. We'll have to figure out why it happened. We have to fix that later. But right now, the only thing that we can do is go solve this problem and make it happen. And every time you're faced with a situation like this, that's your choice. Your choice is either yell at the person who made the problem, um, go, you know, Try to figure out why did this happen. None of those things, when you have to solve a problem, unless they relate to your solution, are necessary. Yelling at the guy who created the problem, it's not going to help you. Right? Your only option is to move forward and to figure out how to solve it and then prevent it from happening the next time. And you need people who can do that. And you should be one of those people. It's one of the most important skill sets you can have. And it will take you further in your career than anything else you learn if you figure out how to do it well. I also believe this is one of those same types of factors. Um, which I call managing by fact. Um, when you're in the midst of business, it's super easy to be emotional, right? Someone didn't do something they were supposed to. Some numbers didn't work like they were supposed to. You look bad because someone didn't submit their report. Lots of people get emotional. The way to manage businesses is to manage by what I call fact. Get the data, look at the data, and manage by that. And there's lots of examples where um, actually, this happens even sometimes with, you know, even our own customers in FAO or, you know, when people relay you information. Everyone only relays you information about the most emotional thing they remember, right? So when something blows up, right, or some customer complains, then everyone's like, we have 100 customers complaining about the same thing. It's like, okay, well, is that actually true? Let's go actually look at the information and data. The only way to solve, be that problem solver, is to separate yourself from some of that emotional stuff and go to the facts. Right? You have to have the data in front of you. You have to be able to look at the numbers and, or the specific things that actually did happen, and you have to take out anything else. Um, I believe in being very data-driven. So when you look at your business, it's, it's very easy to say, you know, we had this great conversation with so-and-so customer, which means we're going to make a ton of money from that. But that's actually not true unless you have all the details and you can manage by the actual things. Every time we go to do an event, I always say, and people I think get really sick of me saying that, hey, where's the pro forma for that? Like, what's the business case? How do we make money? Are we going to lose money on this? And if we go invest in this, why should we invest in this? Um, because w sometimes we'll invest in things where we don't make any money because the things that will come out of that are really interesting to the company. So we'll bet on it. We'll take a risk. But if I don't have the numbers in front of me to even know that, it's really hard to manage a project or your business. Um, we, had, we were doing this exact same thing on one of our events that launched last week. And I'm like, hey, give me the numbers. And then we had these very specific conversations around why we would do something. Where we're like, OK, the reason to go do this, we think we can make money. But it's not the money in this event that's interesting. It's the fact that if we're successful here, then we get to go to 100 other venues with them. Right? And I think you have to be really crisp on what those exact facts are, what the data is, what it tells you. And then you've got to track to it. Right? You've got to start watching things and understanding conversion rates or understanding what the revenue models are. Um, because you, you can get pretty far on just being like, I've got a gut feel. This is great. But if you don't back it up with numbers, then it's really hard to manage all the expectations of the business. And so I think you have to get really, really strong at managing by fact and looking at numbers. Um, let's see, I'll have to see if I left my other one. My other one tied to this, which I guess I took out that one slide, is to, um, to, to not manage with emotion. When you talk to people, you have to take emotion. You have to leave it at the door. You cannot be an emotional manager and expect to be, su be super successful and go far. Um, and everyone has different personalities around emotions, but you have to figure out how to separate when you get emotional. I remember a number of years ago, we had this sales rep, and I was the product manager. She got really mad at me. I can't even remember why now. But she has got really mad at me. And she sent this email 
to our CEO, right? And she CC'd me and she was just really upset about this transaction that had happened. And I was really mad because none of it was true and it was not my fault. And at that point in time, I had two options, right? So I could, I could respond back with a really scathing email. And the downside of doing that is it always makes you look worse than the other person. Um, and, you know, or I could have chosen another method. So quite often when I'm that mad, I'll write the email and never send it, right? Because sometimes I just have to write it. But you can't re respond with the emotion. You have to go back and respond with, this is true, this happened, yep, I made this mistake, I didn't do this, or I did do this, or that's, you know, you, you go back to a place that's constructive that the company can move on from. And it's tied into both of those problem solving and manage my fact, but emotion, it's tough, right? And it's tough for the business to deal with. So the, the less, the more you can figure out how, when you're mad, walk out, like take a break, right? When someone does something that really makes you mad, because they will, there's a bunch of those, because work environments are political, they're filled with people, and so you can't control all of those things around you. And because of that, you have to learn how to manage correctly in those environments. And emotion is a bad way to manage. So I, I would encourage you to figure out how to not do that. This is tied to those two. So I believe that the best people that work for you are the people who are creative. And because they're creative in every aspect, in deliverables, in ways you reach customers, and in, even in problem solving. Right? I like the creativity, and I don't mean that you are an amazing artist. That is not what creativity means. Right? Creativity is in how creative you can, like the problems presented before you, and you're like, oh, that's not a barrier. I can go figure out how to get around that. We can solve that problem. It might take a little bit extra work, but what happens if we take this avenue, or this avenue, or we go this direction? Right? That creativity, which is, I described there as reimagine a familiar situation, practice breaking the rules, and making a list of things that bother you. Right? There's always ways to solve the problem. There's always a path through. And the way you find those are in being creative. And creativity lets you do really cool things. When we built our Facebook app to 80 million users, right, there's a lot of creativity that goes into testing that and figuring out how you engage consumers, what messages work, how you get back to them, how you bring them into things. Right? That, that foundational skill um, is really powerful for you. And it doesn't mean you can, know, you can draw and you're amazing in Photoshop, right? Lots of people translate it to that. It doesn't mean that. It just means that you have these types of skills. I also believe in building a network. Um, this is one that I have always believed in. And lots of people don't come from the same place that I do on this. Um, m for me, my entire career has been built because of networks that I have created. Um, every place I go, the network is important to me. Um, sometimes I'm able to spend more time on it than others, but I've always been around a network, and I've always been around building networks outside of even just the one job that I have. Because it's people and opportunities that you don't know about or those connections that create really powerful opportunities for you. Um, that is an example, the Disney stuff that I got a chance to work on. Um, the, the gentleman that was heading Disney Research who pulled me over, who created the EIR campaign, he and I had worked on a startup years ago, and we became very good friends. And we worked, and then he left that startup, and, and he went to Disney, and he was there for a couple of years. And if, a number of years into that, he was like, hey, Sid, and I was coming off another company, and he said, hey, I need someone to come in. Would you be willing to do that? I would never have had the opportunity without that foundation of a network. Um, I started the Women Tech Council um, you know, because we felt like there was an opportunity to you know, create these communities of networking and mentoring and visibility for women in tech. And that community has been a really powerful place to be able to meet people. We have 40% men in the group, and we do really massive events, um, and we've, we've had this great opportunity to create a platform and, and a space where people can connect that they would where they would never meet each other before. And those networks and those people that I've met there, I would never have met them in the normal course of my job. There's no way. Our circles don't even run in the same space, right? I'm over here doing 3D printing. Uh, one of my great friends is a patent attorney, right? One of my other friends is CI, CTO of a, um, of a Fortune 500 company. We wouldn't meet, right? Our circles would not have naturally connected us. But those networks have created components. And it takes work. Most often I'll hear from people as they come out of school and they take jobs, like, I'm so focused on my job, it's taking so much time, I don't have any time to network. And I believe it is one of the most important things you can do and you have to do in addition to the time that you spend at your job. 
because it is the thing that when you figure out you're really frustrated with your job or you want to take a next step, it will help you get to the next thing. And it takes time and energy. I also believe that as part of building your network, that you should not have an expectation that it re returns stuff to you immediately. That you give of your time and your skills to help other people, knowing that someday it will come back. And not knowing when or how or even if ever. And it doesn't really matter because the influence is felt. When you spend time, when I spend time to go get involved with groups or mentor or network or give advice, I always see something coming back. And maybe not exactly what I expected. Um, but I'm willing to put in the time and I'm willing to build those people and I'm willing to spend whatever little time I have trying to help people um, become successful. Um, and sometimes my time is really limited. Right now I feel like my time is super limited in all the things that I'm doing. Um, but this has always been a really, really important thing to me. And if you look at the people that you admire their careers, you will find that most of them have done this well. That most of them have figured out how to be involved with other people, how to give back, how to figure out how to do their work well and take advantage of helping other people at the same time. And it takes a ton of effort to be able to do this. Because if you think about your job, right, you're like, okay, great, I've got 80 hours of work to do this week, plus you want me to go network or talk to someone. It is hard. It does not come easy. And it takes time, but it's a priority. When we do our Women Tech Award um, nominations, there's three things that we look at. And one is their, and one of them is actually related to their community involvement. Because we believe that the people who are those best examples are the people who not only spend the right time in their career, um, but they also spend time in their communities. Right? And they give back in whatever fashion that they choose to, but that they look at it and go, I want the opportunity to, not, to meet other people and to give back in those communities. And that has become a really important attribute to us. There are some people where if they haven't told us their community or they haven't spent enough time, we'll go back to them and say, hey, you know, you've done a great job. Reapply again as you kind of develop this out. Um, or they'll get bumped out because it's that important to us. We have noticed that those most successful people in business are the ones who, do, who are more well-rounded, who do those things in, to make everyone else successful, including themselves. And, those are the type, and that's the type of person that you want to be, no matter what type of job you have um, going forward. You want those things to be part of the character definition that you have. I think I have. Oh, and then I just put this one on there, which is um, have the right perspective. Like sometimes when you're in the middle of businesses or school, it's easy to get bogged down, like my whole world is falling in, or I'm so frustrated I can't make it through. Take, like just have the right perspective that you can actually get through anything, that it's one moment in time, that you're here for one semester, it's one class, it's one teacher, right? You can, do, you can get through what that means, right? There, your life will be full of lots of hard things. Um, and the great thing is when all of them happen at the same time, right? Personal issues, work issues, family issues, right? It's, it's perfect when they collide all at the same time, which they often do. Um, but you have, to, you have to just have the right perspective that, you know, is you, is you, can, you can make your way through them. It's a moment in time. And if you have the skills that we've been talking about, like being able to have, um, be a problem solver and be creative and manage by fact, those types of things, I think, help you get, gain a greater perspective on making things happen. Because um, at the end of the day, you still have to go through every day, and you still have to do everything that makes you successful. Um, and I, and you know, even as I was kind of thinking about what I was going to say and reflecting on some of the things that I like to talk about, it was a good reflection for me too, right? Like by doing all of those things every day, when, I, when there's so much to do, you know, I w we were just in a meeting before this, and um, my COO, he's like, okay, well, so I got an email for every two minutes we were in this meeting, right? So he looks at it, and he's like, I got 30 emails in the last hour while we've been running this meeting. It gets pretty overwhelming to answer all of those, plus do all of the other work, and plus meet all these deadlines we have. Um, but you just have to gain a little perspective, and you have to get really good at managing by fact, the prioritization, problem solving, and doing all of those things that will make you successful. I guess we could have talked about a million other ones. But at the core, for me, it's these. And if I do these well, then all the other things tend to be able to get handled. I can prioritize better. I can get the work done that we need to. We can work as a team. Um, and anytime one of these is off balance, like if my te the team's off balance, then all these other ones get off balance. Because for whatever reason, one person off balance makes things more emotional. People manage less by fact. Just creates this trickle effect. And so the better that you are understanding and developing these, and you guys are at the perfect time where you're building careers and you're in the early days of those careers, 
And the better you do th these things now, the greater the opportunities expand as you go forward. So I think that's all of my slides. Oh, yep, that is. So I'm happy to answer any questions. I think we only have five minutes, right? But you guys have been really quiet, so you may not have any questions. But I'm happy to answer any. Does anyone have any? Yeah. Um, so we launched basically about a year ago right now. Okay. Um, and we took first, it's really new, we took first product to market in June of 2014. So it's been really crazy. <laughs> yeah. What's the process in making these partnerships with mm. these big um, companies? That's a great question. So his question was, what's the process in doing those big deals? It takes a bunch of time. You know, most of our licensed deals, it was eight to nine months um, in process. And so, you know, it was, we, bu we built product, we built pitch decks, we built stories, we sketched drafts. We did all sorts of things to make those possible. Um, and even, like, if I think of our Walmart, you know, when we started working with Walmart, it was a long process, too. And we first flew to Bentonville and met with them. We have done so, so much to them. And what was interesting about that is probably six or seven months after our first meeting in Bentonville, they picked up the phone and they asked us for a program that we went to go figure out. And so just by the nature of investing in those relationships and keeping them moving, uh, but they were not easy. It took us a bunch of time. Um, I just want to ask about team members. And so if you have one team member that's causing a problem, do you actually just fire that person or do you train them? Do you teach them or do you just do you have to happen So her question was about team members. If you have a team member that's not working, this is one where everyone always struggles, right? Because I always look at everyone and say, they've got great potential, and so maybe the mix isn't right. Um, so I usually, there are some people who would totally say, just fire them and move on. I usually err on some window of trying to fix it. And I'll give you an example. I had a team member a, number, a few years ago that I worked with, and when he was working for me, I could not get his optimal performance out of him, no matter what. It just did not happen. But when someone else came in and he started reporting to him, he became a high-performing team member, right? And so I definitely believe there are instances where you can't manage certain people, but someone else makes them amazingly successful in their role. And so I think you have to be open to that. But then the other thing that I know is there are absolutely times when you just have to get rid of them, where, you know, you can, I guess I usually give myself a window where I'm like, okay, if these things were true, we could be successful. What does that mean? Right? And so I'll kind of go through a step of like, okay, what can I do to make this situation better? What, do I, where do I, what role do I give them? Is it that they're not being accountable enough? How do I define that accountability? Can they step up into this role? But I will tell you that if, if the situation is bad, holding off to do those things is worse. It is way better to get rid of the team member and let the whole team perform than hold on to someone that for a year you're just trying to fix and it's never getting better. Because there are some situations where the, all of those people, they just can't make you successful. And you just have to change it. And the company, immediately that change happens, it gets better. Or the team, or whatever it is. So you have to be bold enough and willing enough to make sure that you did the appropriate things, that you're not the problem, right? And then also make those changes as quickly as possible. Um, if you make them quicker, you're way better off when they have to happen. It's way more painful to hold out for months than anything else. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, when you said that your time at Disney is what inspired you to create this company, the Disney Plus team, like the connections you made there, and that they like the network you make there provide you with this opportunity to create this company. So his question was, did the network I got at Disney allow me to create this company? I actually don't think the two are that connected. I mean, clearly I was at Disney, and clearly we have the Marvel license, right, which are in the, in the same vein. Um, but I didn't know the people that we got the licenses from. Um, so there was, there was definitely some distance there. But it's also definitely true that you know, being able to say I worked at Disney as an EIR opens all sorts of interesting doors. There's no doubt about that. Yeah.